dit Londres. Consider the Oxbow Bend, the watery relic of an earlier river course. Right? We all did Oxbow Bends in geography, and frankly, even in my day, it was fairly redundant knowledge. But I was thinking, as I was helping my daughter with some homework, of how extraordinarily knowledge has moved on since then, how far in advance of the academic curriculum it is. Back in the 1890s, if you were some British colonial administrator in Sudan or somewhere, and you came across one of these geographical features without any prior knowledge, it might have been of some use to you to know what an oxbow bend was. But now, when all that knowledge is a couple of swipes away on your screen, is it really the best way of using those early years? Now, the point I'm making is that necessarily education is always going to lag behind the cutting edge of technology. And in fact, it's a miracle that it doesn't lag further. And the reason it doesn't is because there's an element of innovation and competition and pluralism among schools. And this is what brings us to the argument in favour of having more academic selection in state schools. You know, the whole argument about grammar schools is being held as though we were still living in the early 1960s. Now, opponents of grammar schools talk about kids being consigned, they always use that word, or relegated if they don't pass the 11 plus. But look, you don't have to be on the left to think that there is something wrong with a state-enforced binary division of the entire population aged 11. Right? We're not living in the kind of industrial society that we had before the grammar schools started being merged. And actually, I think they were fairly uh, out of date even then. What free marketeers generally want is not two kinds of schools, but a wide diversity of schools, schools that specialise in sports, schools that specialise in music, schools that are good for kids who are not academically successful and schools that stretch the ones who are. There should be all sorts of provision, faith schools, academies, technical schools. And by the way, if you think that a technical school these days is going to be you know, teaching people woodwork and metalwork, go and visit one and look at the, wo the work that the kids are doing there on 3D printing, on precision engineering, on advanced electronics. Right. Different children have different aptitudes. Comprehensive schools are a vestige of an age when the scientific consensus was that differences in ability were largely environmental. But as Steven Pinker showed in his great magisterial study, The Blank Slate, scientific opinion has moved on. We now know that there are divergent heritable differences in ability. And the idea of comprehensive education is like one of those oxbow bends. It's a vestige of an earlier way of thinking. The more pluralist you can make the school system, the better not just for the kids who are academic, but the better for all kids. And here's the real irony. If you have children with widely divergent abilities in exactly the same school system, you end up with less equal outcomes than if you were able to tailor the education to the aptitudes of the particular child. So here's the really happy news. It doesn't just optimise our resources. It doesn't just improve the kind of people coming in to the workplace and fit them for a modern economy. It doesn't even just make the kids happier whether they're in a technical or an academic or another kind of specialist school. It actually, and this is a good one for any of you lefties in the unlikely event that you're still listening at this stage in the video, it even produces more equal outcomes.